There is this shitty meme going around the historical community that the Puritans were anti-fun. Well, no. They loved singing, having monogamous sex, and reading Paradise Lost. That book includes a chapter where Satan invents artillery and uses it to bombard the forces of heaven. Written by John Milton and published in 1667, Paradise Lost covers Satan's banishment from heaven and his establishment of hell, and how he gets the wrench on God by leading Adam and Eve into temptation, resulting in their expulsion from paradise. Being an epic poem, it isn't written like your average novel in free-flowing text or prose, rather in verse. This meant that the text had a rhythmic structure. Originally, the metric system was invented before widespread writing had been implemented, and poets needed a way to remember their lines. Of course, Milton lived in 17th century England, which had a printing press. He has thought that verse was cool. Speaking of Milton, the dude was blind when he wrote Paradise Lost. He had his friends write it down for him as he recited the lines. Now, I'm far from being an expert in verse, so I won't get into it more, and it isn't relevant to this video, which is about Satan inventing artillery and blasting legions of angels to shreds. The story didn't begin with Satan's rebellion. As is typical with epic poems, such as the Iliad and Aeneid, Paradise Lost begins in the middle of the plot, in media res, not at its absolute start. The backstory is explained over time. Epic poems are divided into books, essentially long chapters, and it isn't until book 6 that the angel Raphael recounts his battle against Satan. First, it should be mentioned that Satan only earned that name once he was banished from heaven. During and before his rebellion, he was known as Lucifer. So why did Lucifer rebel against his master? God had gathered all of his angels to inform him that he was appointing his son to reign over them. The son is, of course, the son, that would later be born as Jesus and sacrifice himself for the sins of man. Lucifer found God's declaration to be unjust. He was equal in rank to the son, so why should he submit to this illegitimate reign and surrender his personal freedoms? Lucifer, or Satan as he would be known, is very much portrayed as a revolutionary and an anarchist in the epic. He's more of an anti-hero, and he wants independence, or at least to control his own destiny. As he says rather famously in the first book, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Neither can he be called a hypocrite, for he makes his decisions in council with his followers. After being sent to hell, he gathers all of them in his palace, in a sort of parliament. These followers saw the foundation shortly after God's declaration. Lucifer implored his fellow angels to join his rebellion, and about one third did so. With his host amassed, Satan took up arms and marched upon God's palace, seeking to depose the so-called tyranny of heaven, and install Lucifer upon his throne. But what did his armies look like? For one, they were massive. The loyalists were led by the archangels Michael and Gabriel. In size, their army was described as So over a many tract of heaven, they marched in many a providence wide, tenfold the length of this terrene. They marched silently to martial music, much like the Achaeans in the Iliad. Meanwhile, Lucifer's forces were described as Far in the horizon, a fiery region. In total, both forces combined numbered in millions, and had the earth then existed, their fighting would have shook the entire planet. This fire came from their swords, as the angels in the epic are oft described as wielding flaming blades. With the epic being so inspired by ancient literature, the angels primarily fought in the fashion of Greeks and Romans, using formations such as phalanxes, testudos, and quadrates. Their main weapons were spears, helmets, and shields. Of course, being angels, the combatants had other advantages. The ability to fly allowed their formations to take on more three-dimensional shapes. It is likewise mentioned that even the least of angels had the ability to wield the elements of the cosmos themselves as their weapons. Two such angels are described as having suns for shields. Lucifer was described as an imposing figure. In the first book, he was described as being the size of an ancient titan. During the battle, he rode a sunbright chariot enclosed with flaming cherubim and golden shields an image not too unlike what shipbuilders of the time sought to emulate on their stern galleries. This imagery, both written and visualized, was the Baroque era at its finest. Satan was armored in gold and wielded a shield of adamant. Lucifer and the angel Abdiel met for a short parley. 
Abdiel announced his pious servitude to God, and Lucifer called him and all others slothful for choosing to serve rather than rebel. Abdiel called Lucifer an apostate and struck at the crest of his helm, cutting it off. The apostate and his rebel forces were amazed, but most of all, enraged. The forces of heaven sheared, Michael sounded the trumpet, and singing Hosanna, they charged into battle. The noise of battle was dire, of blazing chariots charging, fiery darts flying in flaming volleys, some battles occurring on the ground, others in the air, so that the skies themselves seemed engulfed in flames. Michael himself felled entire squadrons with two-handed swings. Lucifer, roaming the battlefield, had finally found his opponent. The two entered a duel where Michael's sword, granted from the very armory of God, severed Lucifer's blade and then cleaved the apostate's side. The thing is that angels cannot die without God explicitly annihilating them. However, Satan's disobedience had rendered him able to bleed and sustain wounds, a shock to himself and his forces. They took him upon their shields and back to his chariot. From thence the rebels retreated. Nightfall came and darkness forced a truce upon the opposing forces. Michael's forces set up camp on the battlefield, whilst Lucifer's retired far into the dark. When all was safe, Lucifer gathered his lieutenants for a council. Here, Lucifer declared that they would need more potent weapons to defeat the army of God. He said that heaven was full of fruits, plants and flowers but that one must be mindful of whence they grew, of the soil, home to dark and crude materials. He said, These inner dark nativity the deep shall yield us pregnant with infernal flame, which into hollow engines long and round, thick rammed at the other bore with touch of fire, dilated and infuriate shall send forth, from far with thundering noise among our foes, such implements of mischief as shall dash, to pieces and overwhelm whatever stands, adverse, that they shall fear we have disarmed the thunderer of his only dreaded bolt. Indeed, Satan was suggesting that his troops constructed cannons. Milton and other poets of the time regarded the cannon and gunpowder weaponry as diabolic inventions that marked the end of chivalric values. As for Satan, inventing cannons was a first step in usurping God, by seizing his ability to control thunder. However, unlike God, who created things from nature, Satan could only pervert. Satan's entourage rejoiced at this declaration and went out to collect materials. They dug the celestial soil, uncovering the sulfurous and nitrous foam, reducing it into gunpowder. Iron was dug up and forged into cannons, and stones chiseled into shot. So within a night, an immense battery had been assembled. When morning rose, a trumpet sounded in the heavenly camp, as God's forces mustered for the next day's fight. The scouts reported sightings of Satan's army marching under spread ensigns in slow but firm battalions. The scouting angel sensed that something was wrong. When he returned, he warned his allies to secure their armor and grip fast their shields, for they would be pelted with a rattling storm of arrows barbed with fire. Satan's army advanced in hollow squares with the deep front lines concealing his artillery. Well within range, Satan's head rose from the battalia as he ordered the front light to unfold to the left and right, revealing his new inventions. God's hosts were left confused, seeing a triple-mounted row of pillars laid on wheels, thinking them hollowed-out tree trunks. Behind each stood a seraph with a flaming reed, and at Satan's command, they opened fire. Milton wrote, Immediate in a flame, but soon obscured with smoke, all heaven appeared, from those deep-throated engines belched, whose roar emboweled with outrageous noise the air, and all her entrails tore the scorching fowl, their devilish glut. The cannons were loaded with round shots and chain shot that clove through the angelic ranks. Thousands on thousands fell to the barrage, being unable to dodge, being so tightly packed together and weighed down by their armor. Together with his lieutenants, Satan stood laughing at the success of his creation and the enemy's misfortune. But again, these are angels we are speaking of and they are unable to die. So they threw off their weapons and armor and began ripping the hills and mountains from the ground and launched them back at Satan's battery. The cannons were buried, but the rebels did not surrender, but tore out their own hills and threw them back. God and the sun watched this terrible tumult from the castle, and God finally ordered the sun to go forth and end this battle. Though Milton described extensively the armor, chariot, bow and arrow given unto the sun, he had no need for these as he rode out against the rebellious forces. 
Hearing the news of this, Michael withdraws the forces of heaven so that the sun alone might deal with the enemy. At first, Satan and his rebels tried fighting the sun, but soon realized there were no match for his lightning strikes. Even then, the sun stopped his lightning before it reached them, as he wished not to destroy, but root them out from heaven. So he drove them before his chariot like a herd of goats to the very borders of heaven. A large cleft opened up before them, and rather than face off against the sun, the rebellious hosts leapt into the pit. Order had been restored, and heaven reclaimed. Satan and his devils fell for nine days. They landed in hell, where they built their own kingdom, and began plotting vengeance. And that's the story of how Satan invented artillery. The main meaning seems to be that technological advancement meant to increase the slaughter of man is the devil's work. Of course, the bombastic and rather silly battle did receive some critique. The character, Poco Curante, says of the book that Who takes up in all seriousness a comic episode in Ariosto and makes devil's fire of cannons in heaven? Neither I nor anyone else in Italy could take pleasure in such pathetic extravagances. The bombasticness and absurdity of the story is exemplary of the Baroque era, its art and literature. Huge thanks to Bradley Rodder, my first supporter on Patreon. If you want to support the channel, please check out the links to PayPal and Patreon in the video description. Otherwise, boost the algorithm by giving the video a like and a comment, and sharing it with a friend. Cheers!